Hi, in the next few minutes, I'm going to teach you all about the wonders of conlanging. What is conlanging? Why, it's a process by which a new... Wow, that was boring! I hope you didn't really think I was going to make you sit through all that. My name is Alexander Sutton, but unless this video goes viral, you probably already knew that. And I'm here to tell you what conlanging is and why it's absolutely awesome. Conlanging is a simple concept. It's making a new language. That's right, you heard me. Why be content with the languages that already exist in the world? Invent your own. You might say, oh, that's boring. Only nerds do that kind of thing. In the next few minutes, I'm going to show you why you're completely wrong. In fact, perhaps once we're finished, I'll have inspired you to make a conlang yourself. So what is a conlang? Well, it's a constructed language. Look at the word, conlang, you know? A constructed language. A constructed language is a conlang, and someone who constructs a language is a nerd. No, a conlanger, not a nerd. Someone who constructs a language is a conlanger, and constructing a language is nerdy. Seriously, the joke died already. Just stop. Constructing a language is conlanging, and why should you do it? Well, that brings me to my next point. One type of conlang is an auxiliary language, or oxlang for short. What's that? Well, have you ever felt yourself frustrated by learning a foreign language or unable to communicate with a foreigner? Have you ever wanted to knock over the language barrier and have everyone on the planet speak a single world language? If you've wished that before, you're not alone. Conlangers have been trying to solve this problem for literally centuries. An oxlang is a language meant for everyone in the world to learn, so that everyone can speak the same language and everyone will be able to communicate with everyone else. The best example of an oxlang is Esperanto. It was created in 1887 by this guy, L. L. Zamenhof, and his dream never came true. Esperanto, his conlang, never became the world language. In fact, you probably never heard of it before, but he wasn't a complete failure. Esperanto has around 2 million speakers, which is about as many as Slovene! <laughs> And it has more speakers than Irish, Eastern Slovak, Latvian, and Sardinian, to name just a few. Plus, there are some native speakers of Esperanto, including this guy, George Soros, whose net worth is $25 trillion. Esperanto even has its own culture, with novels, movies, and songs in the language, and a World Esperanto Congress that's held each year. But in the end, not enough people had faith in Esperanto. It was displaced by English, which is rapidly becoming the new international language. And the sad truth of it is, conlangers who make oxlangs will probably face the same fate as Zamenhof did when he created Esperanto. But oxlangs are still fun to make. But if creating an oxlang doesn't sound like your thing, don't give up on conlanging yet. You might want to make a logical language. It's an interesting idea, basing the grammar of a language off logical mathematics rather than traditional language grammar. The language Logebond does this, and it's basically just spoken computer code. If you're an especially logical thinker, this idea might really appeal to you. But if it's not really your cup of tea, you can create a language for another more practical reason. Keeping your secrets private. It's a personal language! Time for another lesson in the history of conlanging. Don't worry, I'll keep it short. This girl, right here, Hildegard von Bingen, is actually a complete bad, uh, uh, bad rear end, keeping it clean. She's actually the first conlanger ever. Around the year 1200, she created history's first conlang, lingua ignota. What kind of language was this? You guessed it, a personal language. She wrote using lingua ignota in her diary, and we still haven't even completely deciphered it yet. In fact, lingua ignota translates from Latin into unknown language. So, if you want to keep stuff to yourself, invent your own personal language. There's one more type of conlang, and it's arguably the most common type. Out of all of the great reasons to make a conlang, most people do it just out of fun. When you create a conlang purely for its artistic value, it's called an artlang, or artistic language. There have been some pretty influential artlangs before, too. Quenya and Sindarin are two famous conlangs created by J.R.R. Tolkien just for fun, and they featured in many of his novels. In fact, 
He once said that the only reason he wrote The Lord of the Rings was so he could create a home for his Artlings. And you can get paid to conlang. Many movies feature Artlings invented by real linguists who were paid to create these conlangs. For example, remember Avatar? This language is not V. Are there any Game of Thrones fans out there? Well, Dothraki is yet another example of an artistic conlang featuring on television. And don't despair, I won't leave out Harry Potter. Remember Parseltongue? And lastly, the most famous artlang of all, Klingon, the language of the savage aliens of Star Trek. Those are the types of conlangs. I'll shut up about that now because I know you're already super antsy to make one. So here's a fun step-by-step -step guide to conlanging. First, decide what kind of conlang you'd like to make. Do you want to make an artlang or maybe create an oxlang, an international language, or a logical language if you really like math, or create a personal language so no one understands your diary. Once you've got a solid idea of what kind of language you want to make, there's one more decision that you'll have to face. Do you want your language to be a priori or a posteriori? Basically, this means do you want your language to be based on a real language that already exists, or do you want to be completely original and devise new words and new grammar? Go for a priori, which means completely new, if you're making an art lang for fictional aliens from another planet. If they speak a language, why would their language be anything similar to one that exists here on Earth? But go for a posteriori and base it off languages that are already real to make your language easier to learn. So if you're making an oxlang, you want it to be as easy as possible for people to learn. So use familiar words. If you're familiar with Spanish or French, take your best guess at what mi amas vin means. That's right, it's Esperanto for I love you. Using familiar roots like ama for love will make learning the language you create simpler. But can you guess what chamushcha means? Well, unless you speak Klingon, probably not. It also means I love you, but that's not exactly obvious because Klingon is an a priori language. Now we're finally ready to dive into conlanging. The very first step is phonology, but phonology is just a word that people who are trying to act smart use when they're talking about what sounds are in the language. Why is it so easy to tell which language is being spoken even if you don't understand what they're saying? Because they all have a distinct sound. The phonology of these languages is distinct, easily recognizable, and well put together. Why does French sound like French? Because it has all of these nasal vowels, en, en, and that grating r, r, that r sound that's so distinct. These all give it that distinct French flavor. But what about Mandarin Chinese? It's the melodic syllables abruptly shifting from going up to going down. And the abundance of words that start with sh, xing shang shong, xing sheng, and how so many words end in ng, wing wong ching chong. I mean, sure, it's stereotypical, but it's true. That is the phonology of Mandarin Chinese. Your mission as a good conlanger is to design a phonology that makes sure your language is distinct. You need to know how to pick the sounds that will make up the words of your language, and we're gonna do just that. There's two main types of sounds consonants and vowels. Consonants are when your mouth blocks air from coming out of your mouth and it doesn't let the air flow freely. Pick sounds that are already familiar to you, like those in English, and put them into your language. And if you speak a second language, even better! You can add sounds from there too. You can even invent sounds. You can put those in your language. As you think of consonant sounds, make a list. It can just be bullet points describing the way you pronounce each sound. Let's say Jimmy is a new conlanger and he's creating a phonology. He starts with the consonants, just like a good conlanger does, and he decides to include the sounds putaka, budaga, saza, mana, khala, ya. That's a lot of sounds, but he's still leaving out quite a few that exist in English, such as fa, va, ra, tha, sha, wa, just to name a couple. But that's okay, he doesn't have to use all of the sounds that exist in English. He also speaks Spanish, so he adds in a few sounds he learned from Spanish class. Enye, nya, nya, and the rolled R, ra, ra. Then he comes up with a new sound, all on his own. This is a clicking sound, and clicking sounds exist in some languages too, especially in African languages. Now he has a whole bunch of very diverse sounds. His language sounds completely different from English, which is great. That's what a good conlanger does. I hope you feel confident about selecting consonant sounds for your language, because now we get to move on to the vowels. 
These are extremely important to the sound of your language as well. They're the filler space in between consonants. Without vowels, the sentence she read the book would become shred the book. Yeah, see? If you know how to pick your vowels well, you can make your language sound even more distinct. When you're picking your vowels, use a few vowels from English, but don't be tempted to steal every one. Take from other languages too, or invent a new vowel sound. It's up to you. Let's go back to Jimmy. He's got his consonants, and now he's picking his vowels. From English, his language receives the sounds e, u, and a. From Spanish, he grabs a and o. He takes the u sound from German and the nasalized o sound from French. And you should be just like Jimmy. That's how you get a phonology for your conlang. Pick good, distinct consonants and do just as well with the vowels. Now you should have a phonology for your conlang if you followed all of these steps. And even if your phonology is really rudimentary, it should still serve you well for your first conlang. Now that you have your phonology down, it's time to start inventing your grammar. Don't be scared. When I say grammar, you probably think of dusty textbooks and cranky language teachers getting mad at you for improper conjugation or a split infinitive. This sucks, which is why it's so convenient that none of that stuff is involved in conlang grammar. Making up grammar for your language can be really fun. You can control exactly how a whole language puts ideas together, but why even worry about grammar, right? Couldn't we just reuse English grammar and substitute the English words for ones in my language? Wouldn't that be easier? Well, if you did that, you'd just be relaxing English. That's not a conlang, it's a code. If the grammar is the same, then it's essentially the same language as English, just with a different phonology and a different vocabulary. Plus, English grammar sucks. It's so damn complicated and illogical. That's why you hate English grammar class so much. And hey, if English grammar bothers you so much, why not make your conlang have a different grammar, which you like more? For example, if you're making an oxlang, you can simplify the grammar to make it more logical. Let's say that the word for to be is sa. Instead of saying I am, you are, he is, like in English, you could simplify it in your oxlang to I sa, you sa, he sa, etc. So that the verb for to be doesn't change randomly like it does in English. See? It's so satisfying to fix English grammar because English grammar is so broken. Or if you're making an art lang, you could decide to complicate the grammar. Sure, English has past, present, and future tense. The language Chinook has present and future too, but it has four past tenses. There's a past tense for recently in the past, one for kinda recently in the past, one for a little while ago in the past, and one for a long time ago in the past. You see? That's a really complicated grammar, and sometimes complicated grammar can make your language way more rich. There's so many ways to shake it up and have fun with language grammar, and you can do it any way you want for your conlang. I'm gonna tell you a few basic ways you can shake up the grammar for your conlang. Now, when you're talking about grammar, it can get really complicated with fancy words like morphology and syntax. And these are awesome subjects, I'm not gonna lie, but I'll spare you for now. Wait until you get to your college linguistics course for those. For now, it's just enough to talk about inflection. Inflection is modifying a word to change its meaning. We do this in English. We add s to the end of nouns to make it plural, and we add ed ed at the end of verbs to express past tense. These are inflections. Believe it or not, English is only moderately inflected. Chinese, at one end of the scale, has almost no inflections, while languages like Spanish and Russian are pretty heavily inflected. But Nothing is as heavily inflected as Greenlandic. You can inflect so much in that language that one word can be a whole long inflected sentence. In Greenlandic, the single word means once again they tried to build a giant radio station, but it was apparently only on the drawing board. Yeah, I know, that is inflection right there. As you can see, there's a lot of choice for your conlang when it comes to inflection. You could be like English with a bit of inflection or like Chinese with almost nothing. Or make like Greenlandic and have entire sentences be just one long, highly inflected word. There's so much more stuff in grammar I could tell you about, like syntax and word order, how to form clauses, the number system, gender, articles, etc. But I can see your eyes glazing over and I'm running out of time. 
Besides, there's a map that I really need to get started drawing. Now you should know how to make a conlang and why you should make a conlang. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I'll leave links to more conlang information in the description below. That's all for today. Alex out!